was uh, driving with a friend of mine, and we were just driving down the road. I don't know where we were headed, but hopped in my car and we took off and was listening to the radio, and I heard this bleep where this guy came in, and he said, uh, "It is the body is it has not been said which you know, whose body it is or something like that." Um, but uh, we know that there is w it, it is a male, and it is, you know, was it's been, it was found dead or whatever in whatever you know building or, or house, and then it, it just kind of cut off to like a commercial. But it was definitely one of those things where I turned on and jumped into a like, oh, there's this obviously some kind of a news brief going on, you know, it wasn't just like standard news in the news today. I had somewhat of a unique story in that I was one of the very first people to find out. Uh, the electrician who discovered Kurt's body called a local radio station called KXRX. And I had been a contributor to KXRX. I would go on there and do local music news. So before they even went on the air with the announcement, they called me at my office at the Rocket and said, there's a body at Kurt Cobain's house. Could it be Kurt? And it was really odd because without really knowing and waiting through a commercial break, somehow I was thinking, that's probably Kurt. I don't know why. I don't know what made me think that. I just felt it. It's like, that's probably Kurt. It was about a half an hour later that that news broke and went public. And I just remember sitting in my office and, and thinking that this just can't be true. He had a number of suicides in his family. He himself thought that suicide was genetic. The things that happened to him with fame, what happened with Courtney Love, all those things are so secondary, I think, ultimately to the man's genetic makeup and genetic predisposition deposition to depression, which I think is really is the lens we have to look at his death under. I think the thing to me was, and I've, I've always felt that, I think it was just kind of like, almost like being robbed, you know? There was just certain things that I kind of wanted to say, you know, things that I would have liked to have, you know, talked with him about, you know? Not necessarily anything specific, just that we hadn't talked in a while. You know, and I realized that was gone. You know, that was that was that was, that was the hardest part for me. That was just gone. You know, it was, the opportunity wasn't even going to happen anymore. So, the tragic uh, ending to a life that had been as quick as a flashing uh, star on the horizon. Kurt wrote the song about living under the bridge and told that story, which I found out was mythical. He didn't really live under the bridge. But the true story was even sadder, that he uh, was homeless for a time, and he broke into houses that were being built and slept there. He would break into apartments or, or go into apartments and sleep in the hallways. These are just very sad stories. And there's one story in my book, which I think is absolutely the single most heartbreaking story of his entire life. that. He would go into the hospital that he had been born in, and he would sleep in the waiting room because he wanted a warm place to sleep. And he figured if he was in a hospital, nobody would come up and say, why are you here? Um, what a horrible, sad existence that his life had led to that point. The hospital was only about a half a mile away from where his mother lived, but he felt like he would rather be sleeping in a waiting room in an emergency room than he would his own house. In Charles Cross's uh Cobain biography, he reveals that Kurt actually, in 1990, I think, applied for a job cleaning shit out of a dog kennel, and he didn't get the job. Um, that shows how desperate, in a way, that uh, he was. And the other members of Nirvana were no better. They were living in fairly, you know, unprepossessing circumstances. That's, you know, they regarded, for them, from a depressed uh, working class background uh, that they came from, rock and roll was a career option in a sense. It was an escape. It was a means to escape their, uh, their circumstances. He sent his tapes off to about, I think about 25 or so different record companies, including Alternative Tentacles and a lot of other ones, ones that scratch, the one that Scratch Ads was on and so forth. And uh, he was pretty disappointed that he didn't get any response from most of them. I think he got a, two or three letters back saying that they weren't interested. And that really bummed him out a lot. But he put all the effort into writing the letters and sending, sending the tapes off. There was something that I just sort of felt you know, with being in the band and stuff, and it's like, I could just tell that there was some, you know, there was something going on, and that I knew that, that, you know, Kurt had some, you know, something that was really unique and cool that, uh, that was going to, you know, come out eventually at some point, you know. I think the big question was when, you know, we didn't know that.
what I liked about Kurt, I guess, a lot was his personality. He was he was he could be very funny. He would tell jokes and and play jokes and, and on people. He uh, liked a lot of the same kind of music that I did. He liked a lot of us doing the same sort of things, and he was very artistic too. He could draw really well. Uh, you know, he played guitar, but th that that didn't matter to me so much at the time. I actually liked the fact that he could draw and stuff, and it was funny more than that. Well, Kurt Cobain's story is one of the most fascinating in rock because few people predict their career as accurately as he did. I mean, many kids will grow up and boast, I'm going to be a star when I grow up and all of you will be sorry that you were so mean to me. Kurt Cobain is one of the few people who made those schoolyard taunts and, and ended up basically creating his own life story that way. So we're good friends and, and playing music and doing what we did, but uh, you know, he was kind of a quiet person, but, but it was good, you know? Um, he was tremendously ambitious. At the same time, he acted like he wasn't ambitious. That was part of his sort of punk rock star persona. He acted as if fame was accidental, where every single step along the way, he pursued fame tremendously. He drove a Volvo station wagon because he had read that it was the safest single car ever made, and he was an extremely safe driver, very cautious, didn't want to get in an accident. Yet at the same point, he drove that station wagon to heroin dealer's house, bought drugs, recklessly overused those drugs, and overdosed many times. At the end of the day, he, he had a very contradictory relationship with the rock lifestyle and with fame. And he thought he wanted it, and he knew that he didn't. And he could never make those two things gel or, or, or live alongside each other in any way. The first prescription drug he was really given was Ritalin because he was hyperactive at the time, they thought. And there is quite a bit of medical literature debating whether it's a positive thing to give kids at that point. Many people find that it helps calm kids down, but there are others who argue that by letting kids think that drugs can affect their mood and, and getting them sort of hooked on this cycle of drugs can control you psychologically, They've argued that kids that took Ritalin are more likely to do drugs later in life. There are some other studies who argue the opposite. So exactly what the scientific data is, I don't know. But there were some in Kurt's life who felt that, that his early uh, you know, prescription use of Ritalin probably began his lifelong uh, use of per, you know, prescription and non-prescription drugs. I think that he was uh, very troubled by the fact that he couldn't go anywhere without being recognized and asked for autographs and mobbed and couldn't get through dinner without a lot of people asking him to talk to him and tell him how great he was. I think uh, even though Chris was more recognizable, I think Chris had an easier time in dealing with it. And unfortunately, I think he decided to turn to drugs to help relieve the pain of that and the stress. Because I mean, people forget too that becoming a millionaire in a short period of time is also just as stressful as losing your job and losing a lot of money. Heroin, which is a drug that is most closely associated with Kurt Cobain in the popular literature and the popular myth, really was a drug he didn't begin doing until the last three years of his life. Th this is a launch for an album of the biggest band in the world and the singer ODs. You, know, you, you break into his bedroom, you hear a scream, you break in to find him slumped behind the door with a syringe and Kelly, you remember Kelly, the nanny, mm -hmm. rushed in and like smacked him in the solar plexus and he <gasps> came round. And then we, <laughs> you're going downstairs, it uh, always reminds me of a spitting Im image with Brezhnev going, oh, we may have had a little accident with our <laughs> nuclear power station and a friend of mine. It's it, like it the was, interview could be delayed 15 yeah, minutes. <laughs> type of thing. I think it's a real shame that he that he turned to heroin. I think it's. Uh, I wish he would have found a better way to deal with things. Either, if I don't know if he needed antidepressants or just if he should have tried to, s maybe not tour as much and stay out of the public eye and just back off a little bit and gradually ease into becoming more famous. Instead of, they did a lot of touring. They did a lot of shows. They were out there a lot. The, you know, those couple of years, before he ended up dying. I think it's unfortunate that Kurt is so painted in this image as a junkie. When the truth is, is that heroin certainly became a huge problem for him and it played a big role in his death, but that was really only the last few years of his life. Most of his life he, he actually was a fairly sober and sane person.
how should we remember Kurt? By playing his music. The fact that we're talking about Kurt Cobain's music 10 years after the guy died explains a lot. It tells us that his music meant something. The songs Cobain wrote touched the generation that grew up listening to that and then remarkably it has now touched a successive generation. The comparison game, I, I, it drives me up the wall, you know, he, oh he was like this or he was like that. No, actually he wasn't like any of that. Nirvana's popularity today uh, is entirely down to Nirvana's music. There's plenty of bands who were around 10, 15 years ago uh, from that, you know, general scene who's, uh, you know, who have who have gone and who wa and whose music won't be troubling us again. Any reputation is that that he should or get deserve or whatever, you know, has to be just made on a base comparison on what this individual did. I would just hope that he'd be remembered more as not just as a musician or someone that, you know, flamed out, dying of a drug overdose, dying of a drug overdose, but somebody that was artistic, that did a lot of paintings, that did a lot of writing, that um, cared about other people, you know, and things that are going on in the world, not just himself, and, uh, you know, as well as his music. But he, he, there's a lot of things involved to him besides just Nirvana. Uh, for as long as people are curious and are interested in, in, in rock music, then Nirvana will be there, because their music mattered. Cobain, to a number of the kids that are even growing up today, has almost become like a stop you make in adolescence. I would compare him, you know, on a literary side to J.D. Solinger, where when I grew up, my generation, we all read Solinger's work. It's something you had to read to sort of understand adolescence. Nirvana's music, I think, plays the same musical role. It is so tied into those feelings of youth that Today I see so many kids going up that end up going back to Cobain as something that they find meaning in their own lives from. I go to uh, gigs now and I see kids, and they are kids, they're like, you know, some of them as young as sort of 13 to 15 years old wearing Nirvana t-shirts and stuff. So, you know, some of those people were barely born, you know, <laughs> were not born um, when Nirvana were making their music. And yet, you know, those people know Nirvana's music now. So ultimately, I think that was Kurt's greatest gift to us. He put so much of himself into his songs that when we listen to it, they, they seem so emotionally true. They almost can't be denied.